Hey film friends, I'm Nick Furman. This is Furman on Film. Welcome to the channel. Ah, Shocktober, baby. One of my favorite times of year. But each year there's a balance I'm trying to strike. On the one hand, we've got a horror boom going on right now. The emergence of Shudder and Tear Flicks dropped right on streaming has resulted in a total proliferation of new content. Then there's also big, and mediocre, studio horror like Smile 2 and the Terrifier series. It's a busy 31 days every year. So that brings us to today. I thought I'd give you all a little tasty treat. The recent past and present in a macabre dance. This is my top 10 horror films of the past 10 years, each one in 45 seconds or less. You think, you think we can do it in 45 seconds or less? I'm gonna try. We're gonna just, let's give it our best shot. Yeah, yeah let's do it. <laughs> Ready for this? <sighs> Coming in at number 10, Host. All right, look, most of the best horror has been set to particularly poke at our current state of fear and unease in the world. Here is a film that was the perfect movie for its time. Journey back with me for a sec. It's 2020, we're all wearing masks, and the Zoom screen has become almost our constant friend. So director Rob Savage grabs a hold of this and gives us what we never knew that we needed or wanted. A found footage horror fest of a group of 20-somethings on a Zoom seance. The final 20 minutes here are step on your jugular, hair-raising horror. Tension mounting and building to a fever pitch, and it's all done by a guy with the visual chops to know how to employ negative space, looping background effects, and the ultimate knowledge that somehow were the seventh zoomer. Number nine, The Invitation. Let's be clear. I'm talking about the 2015 Karakusama masterwork of slow-burning tension, not the hot garbage 2022 Dracula-adjacent reboot. You know, the one where the ex gets invited to a prim and proper dinner party with his former flame and her eccentric but seemingly nice new beau? That is, until the group is introduced to a bizarre spiritual group with some rather arcane beliefs. Here's a picture that takes something many of us have experienced and flips it on its head. Group social dynamics slowly turning trust into manipulation, growing paranoia we can't quite seem to put our finger on, throw in some unresolved grief for the loss of a loved one, eerie atmosphere in spades, and a third act which truly goes there, and you end up with a delightful work that readily belongs on this list. Number eight, The Babadook. Ah, repressed grief, unresolved trauma, emotional turmoil. What's not to love? A grieving mother mourning the loss of her husband and a son who is plagued by visions of a monster who keeps morphing into familiar appearances to the boy. Look, I get it. Some of us are getting a little tired of the supernatural as metaphor for depression and sadness trope. But this one has emotional depth and a powerful performance from Essie Davis as a mother whose mental deterioration is spine tingling. As the monster's presence intensifies, Amelia's grip on reality unravels, giving us a haunting exploration of how grief can consume and destroy. If you want layered, character-driven horror, look no further. If it's in a word or in a look, you can't get rid of the Babadook. <laughs> And at number seven, Possessor. Brandon Cronenberg, welcome to the party. Here's a sci-fi horror flick set in a dystopian future where elite assassins can possess the bodies of others to carry out high profile hits. It's all well and good until Vazia enters the mind of a dude who wants to fight back on the astral plane. You know, what I love most about this one is it totally slaps as just a gory body horror with unreal visuals. Jaw-dropping sequences of acts of possession, conversations on a psychic plane, differing tones and brightness on this distinct color palette. But like his old man, Cronenberg is also teaching us about the loss of autonomy that humans are increasingly giving up to their technological devices, begging the question, how soul-killing can the enterprise of allowing ourselves to be subsumed by an outside influence be? Yeah. Number six, The Witch. Let's kick this one off with one of the greatest lines in film history. Wouldst thou like to live deliciously? This one was billed as a New England folktale. In other words, a total playpen for Robert Eggers' wondrous facility with vernacular language. One of the greatest subtitle movies ever made. Puritanical dialogue on overdrive. 
But really, this is just about evil lurking in the woods outside of a devout family's home. Witches consuming livestock, babies going missing, and one very interesting black goat. Here's a film that cascades into episodes of violence, betrayal, and all sorts of malevolence. A work that pits the supernatural evils outside us against repressed desires for religious perfection within. And holy wow, that final five minutes. Number five, It Follows. What's the oldest horror trope in the book? Anyone? How about this? Every horror movie begins with two, generally white, people having sex. Director David Robert Mitchell takes the conceit and sends it to the stars. It Follows has this unique, menacing dark and blue photography. It builds fear through atmosphere and concept, but what it does best is offer a primer on creating the perfect villain, make it ubiquitous and faceless. Everyone and no one at the same time. That's the it in this movie. And how do you get rid of it? Well, you sleep with someone else and make them the next target. Guys, what we have here is an STD monster. What great subtle commentary on the dangers of irresponsible sexual expression. Marry that to a relentless, unstoppable force. Maybe the best existential dread film on this list. Number four, Hereditary. Does it get much better than haunting films about the twisted legacy of dark secrets within a family's history? Ari Aster's debut would argue no. Here's a story about the Graham family and how they unravel the mystery surrounding their ancestry while increasingly being harassed by supernatural occurrences and disturbing visions. Then we start to unearth some occult rituals and it gets bonkers. This one was kind of a harbinger of what was to come with elevated horror. In this case, Aster is clearly tapping into themes like grief, mental illness, generational curses, and the inescapable nature of inherited trauma. But it's really Tony Collette's knock you on your butt, all in performance, and the unsettling atmosphere and disturbing imagery that packs the hardest punch here. All right, if you made it this far, we've got the top three coming. So stick around and subscribe. Wouldst thou like to live deliciously? Number three, The Wailing. Of all the films on this list, this is the one I rewatched most recently. And holy crap, is this a banger. Listen, sometimes they just don't make them here in the States like they do internationally. Korean horror in particular is a veritable wellspring of golden storytelling. See, their horror just hits different. You get rich cultural backdrops and intricate narratives that are built out across multiple hours of viewing. So you get the supernatural horror and mystery, but it's contextualized into these religious elements of competing shamans and ceremonies to ward off demons. Here, it's a a kind of virus that is spreading, resulting in heinous killings of whole families. Yet what has this one so high ultimately is the final sequence. It's a showdown of cross-cutting worthy of the good, the bad, and the ugly, where we're completely unsure who to believe and who is a fraud as whole lives hang in the balance. Number two, get out. Imagine taking that Sidney Poitier classic Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and blowing it to smithereens. That's what Jordan Peele did with this unreal debut, Get Out. A social commentary rich psychological horror that somehow married standard horror elements to pitch black comedy with stunning results. Thought provoking and terrifying. In Peele's hands, a visit to your girlfriend's parents becomes almost Lynchian in mind paranoia or Hitchcockian. Hitchcockian? What's wrong with this guy? Intention, not to mention sci-fi body horror elements. What an exquisite tightrope between tension and insight into societal issues. And don't forget that last little amusing nugget of truth. White liberals can be racist too. Here we are, at last, The Mountaintop, my number one film of the past 10 years, 2014 to 2024. Can you guess it? Here it is. Number one, Midsommar. What if I told you the best horror flick of the last 10 years was a picture about toxic relationships and emotional manipulation set in broad daylight? Come on, nothing can go wrong when a grieving girl joins her distant boyfriend and friends on a trip to rural Sweden during a midsummer festival. It's peaceful and idyllic, you know, until violent pagan practices and ritual suicides start. I love Midsommar for its striking visual style. Think 10 minute opening and hallucinogenic scenes. But my favorite part of all is Astor himself saying this was a breakup movie dressed up in folk horror arraignment. It's like the Wicker Man meets 10 Things I Hate About You filtered through the power of communal control. What do you do when the ritual may be about you? Art house, psychological folk horror to the max. Nothing has been this good in the past 10 years. <laughs> well, 
there you have it, my special Halloween top 10 episode. If you enjoyed this review, please let us know by smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. I'd also love to hear your comments. Do you agree with our rankings? What movies did we miss? And don't forget to visit FermanOnFilm.com for even more movie content. Thanks for watching. I'm Nick Furman. This is Furman on Film. Stay firm and spooky, my friends.